Hey guys, so um, we're going to be doing chapter 6 today. Um, I'm really sorry if, uh, well, it's going to happen. I I'm sorry, this one's going to probably be a lot choppier than others. Um, I've been kind of under the weather lately. I think I stressed myself out enough to make myself a little bit sick. So, um, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna have to start and stop a little bit more. Um, I'm hoping to get through 6, 7, and probably eight this week, um, which is really huge because I haven't looked at chapter seven yet, but that one, that one's long. Um, but thankfully chapter six is only about 20 pages, so let's get into it. Chapter six, the Etruscans. Framing the era, the portal to the Etruscan afterlife. The Etruscans, as everyone knows, were the people who occupied the middle of Italy in early Roman days, and whom the Romans, in their usual neighborly fashion, wiped out entirely. End quote. Didn't know that was going to be. Okay. So opened D. H. Lawrence's witty and sensitive Etruscan places, 1929, one of the earliest modern essays to place a high value on Etruscan art and treat it as much more than a debased form of Greek art. Quote, most people despise everything B.C. that isn't Greek, for the good reason that it ought to be Greek if it isn't. End quote. Lawrence quipped. Uh, fortunately, scholars and the public at large soon also came to admire the Etruscans, and it has been a long time since anyone had to argue for the importance and originality of Etruscan art. Indeed, although influenced by Greek art, Etruscan art differs in many fundamental ways. The tomb of the Augurs, datable around 520 BCE, makes that point forcibly, forcefully. It is one of thousands of underground tombs laboriously carved out of the, out of the bedrock at the important Etruscan city of Tarquinia, at a time when the Greeks still buried their, deb, their dead in simple graves with a statue or stele, as a commemorative marker. The Etruscan tomb also has fresco paintings on all four walls, an art form virtually unknown in 6th century BCE Greece. And although the Tarquinian painters adopted many late archaic Greek stylistic features, the subjects they represented are distinctly Etruscan. At the center of the rear wall is a large, is a large door. Sorry, you can already hear my, my voice doing a little thing. Uh, probably the symbolic portal to the underworld and the afterlife. Two facing men extend one arm toward the door and place one hand against the forehead um, against the forehead in a double gesture signifying salute and mourning. At the far end of the right wall is a man in a purple robe, a mark of his elevated stature, and two attendants. One carries a chair, the official seat of the man's high office. The other sleeps, or most likely weeps, crouched on the ground. The official is likely one, the one who has died. Died. <laughs> Gosh, I'm so sorry about my voice this time, guys. But I gotta get it done, you know? Okay. The rest of the right wall, as well as the left and front walls, depict the funerary games in honor of the dead men. To the right of the official and his attendants is a man with a curved staff, similar to the litus of the, Ro of the Roman priests, called augurs, hence the modern name of the tomb. Etruscan priests studied the flight patterns of birds to predict the future, but this Etruscan, quote, augur is really an, uh, um, an umpire at a wrestling match. To the right, a masked man labor labeled um, fair Sue. Another fierce is at the far end of the left wall, controls a fearsome dog on a leash, which also entangles and restrains the legs of a club-wielding man. A sack covers the man's head, rendering him an almost helpless victim of the dog, which has already drawn blood. Some historians regard this gruesome contest as a direct precursor of Roman glad gladiatorial shows. In any case, Etruscan art and architecture unquestionably provided the models for the earliest Roman painters, sculptors, and architects. I'm going to see if... I, I'm, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can definitely feel it. Um, 
scratchiest of my voice. I'm going to try and see if whispering helps, so maybe turn up your volume for a little bit. Itch, um, Etruria and the Etruscans. The heart of the Etruscans, who called themselves Rosena, was the territory between the Arno and the Tiber rivers of central Italy. The lush green hills still bear their name. Tuscany, the land of the people whom the Romans called Etrusci, or Tusci, or Tusi, I think. The region centered on Florence. So, too, do the blue waters that splash against the western coastline of the Ita Italian peninsula, for the Greeks referred to the Etruscans as Tyrsenoi, Tyrsenoi, <laughs> or Tyrhenoi, and gave their name to the Ty Tyrhenian Sea. Both ancient and modern commentators have debated whether the Etruscans were an indigenous people or immigrants. Their language, although written in a Greek-derived script, is unrelated to the Indo-European linguistic family and remains largely undeciphered. Again, sorry for the noise. I, I do live on a street and today is a weekday, which means construction. Okay. The 5th century BCE Greek historian Herodotus claimed that the Etruscans came from Lydia, in Asia Minor, and that Tyrsenos was their king, hence their Greek name. But Dionysus of Halicarnassos, a 1st century BCE Greek historian, maintained that the Etrusci were native Italians. Um, some modern researchers have theorized that the Etruscans uh, emigrated to Italy from the north. No doubt some truth exists in each theory. The Etruscans of historical times, the Racena, were very likely the result of a gradual fusion of native and immigrant populations. This mixing of peoples occurred in the early first millennium BCE during the Villanovan period, named for an arche uh, archaeological site near present-day Bologna. Bologna? Maybe? <laughs> At that time, contemporaneous with the geometric period in Greece, the Etruscans emerged as people with an art-producing culture related to but distinct from those of other um, Italic peoples and from the civilizations of, Greeks, of Greece and the Orient. I'm noticing that you can probably hear more mouth noises if I whisper, so um, I'm going to try going back to full voice. Um, hopefully you guys like this better, because, I mean, I, I don't have, I literally don't have the time to go back through the recordings and see how my voice goes, so, you know, just leave it in the comments. I'll, I'll, I'll do my best, you know? I'm not gonna hurt my voice, but I'll do my best. During the 8th and 7th centuries BCE, the Etruscans, as highly skilled seafarers, enriched themselves through trade abroad. By the 6th century BCE, they controlled most of northern and central Italy. Their most powerful cities included Tarquinia, Servetri, Volsi, and Ve. These and the other Etruscan cities never united to form a state. However, so it is inaccurate to speak of an Etruscan, quote, nation or, quote, kinga, kingdom, but, uh, but only of Etruria, the territory that the Etruscans occupied. Any semblance of unity among the independent Etruscan cities was based primarily on common lin linguistic ties and religious beliefs and practices. Early Etruscan art. Although art historians now universally acknowledge the distinctive character of Etruscan painting, sculpture, and architecture, they still usually divide the history of Etruscan art into periods uh, mirroring those of Greek art. Their 7th century BCE is the orientalizing period of Etruscan art, followed by the archaic, classical, and Hellenistic periods. Orientali orientalizing art. <laughs> During the orientalizing period, the Etruscans successfully mined iron, tin, copper, and silver, creating great wealth and, in the process, transforming Etruscan society. Villages with agriculture-based economies gave way in the 7th century BCE to prosperous cities engaged in, in, uh, engaged in international commerce. Wealthy families could afford to acquire foreign goods, 
and the Etruscan elite quickly developed a taste for luxury objects incorporating Eastern motifs. To satisfy the demand, local artisans inspired by imported, inspired by imported goods produced magnificent objects for both homes and tombs. As in Greece, uh, at the same time, the locally manufactured orientalizing artifacts cannot be mistaken for their foreign models. Uh, Regolini Galassi tomb. About 650 to 640 BCE, a wealthy Etruscan family in Servetri stocked the, Re the Regolini uh, Galassi tomb, named after its excavators, with bronze cauldrons and gold jewelry produced in Utruria, but of orientalizing style. The most spectacular of the many luxurious objects found in the tomb is a gold fibula, a clasp or safety pin, of unique shape used to fasten a woman's gown at the shoulder. The gigantic disc-shaped fibula is in the italic tradition, but the five lions striding across its surface are motifs originating in the Orient. The technique, also emulating Eastern imports, is masterful, combining repose and granulation, the fusing of tiny metal balls or granules to a metal surface. The Regolini, Gala <laughs> Regolini Galassi fibula equals or extends in quality anything that might have served as a model. The jewelry from the Regolini Galassi tomb also includes a gold pectoral that covered a deceased woman's chest, and two gold circulates that may be earrings, although they are large enough to be bracelets. A taste for this kind of ostentatious display is frequently the hallmark of newly acquired wealth, and this was certainly the case in 7th century BCE, Etruria. Oh, I'll be right back. I'm going to see if I can get my, my voice better. All right, I took a cough drop. I've got one hour before class starts, and I really hope that I can get through this. Okay, Etruscan temples. In religious architecture, for example, the differences between Etruscan temples and their Greek prototypes outweigh the similarities. Because of the materials that Etruscan builders employed, usually only the foundations of their temples have survived. The same is true of Etruscan civic and domestic structures, but the extent of foundations at the Etruscan site of Marzabello, um, Marzaboto established that the Etruscans laid out their towns according to a rational grid plan. Fortunately, the scanned remains of Etruscan temples are supplemented by the Roman architect uh, Vitruvius's tre treaties? Treatise? 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 <laughs> On architecture written near the end of the first century BCE. In it, Vitruvius provided an invaluable chapter on Etruscan temple design. Archaeologists have, have constructed a model of a typical archaic Etruscan temple based on the preserved foundations of Etruscan temples and on Vitruvius's account. 6th century BCE, Etruscan temples resembled contemporaneous Greek stone gabled, um, stone gable roofed temples, but had wood columns, a tile covered timber roof, and walls of sun-dried mud brick. Entrance was, entrance was only possible via a narrow staircase at the center of the front of the temple, which sat on a high podium, the only part of the building made of stone. The proportions also differed markedly. Uh, Greek temples were about twice as long as, right? Greek temples were about twice as long as wide. According to Vitruvius, and confirmed by the archaeological record, the typical ratio for Etruscan temples was 6 by 5, or 6 to 5. Greek and Etruscan architects also arranged the columns in distinct ways. The columns in Etruscan temples were usually all at the front of the building, creating a deep porch occupying roughly half the podium and setting off one side of the structure as the main side. By contrast, the front and rear of Greek temples were indistinguishable, and builders placed steps and columns on all sides. The Etruscan temple was not meant to be seen as a sculptural mass from all directions, as Greek temples were. Rather, it had a strong frontality directing visitors to the axial entrance. 
Furthermore, although the columns of Etruscan temples resembled Greek Doric columns, Tuscan columns were made out of wood, were unfluted, and had bases. Also, because of the lightness of the timber superstructure, fewer, more widely spaced columns were the rule in, Etrus in Etruscan temples. Unlike their Greek counterparts, Etruscan temples also frequently had three cellas, one for each of their chief gods, Tinia, Uni, and uh, Menreva. Men... sure, whatever. <laughs> Pedimental statuary was also rare in Etruria. The Etruscans normally placed life-size narrative statuary in terracotta instead of stone, along the roof ridges of their temples rather than in the pediments, as was the Greek custom. Apollo of Vey. The finest surviving Etruscan temple statue is a life-size image of Apulu, which displays the energy and excitement that characterize uh, archaic Etruscan art in general. The statue comes from the rooftop of a temple in the Portonacio Sanctuary at Vey. This is V-E-I-I, -I, by the way. Popularly known as the Apollo of Vey, it is but one of a group of at least four painted terracotta figures that adorned the temple's ridge beam. The statues depicted one of the twelve labors of Hercule, Heracles. Apulu confronted Heracl for possession of the hind of Serenia, a wondrous gold-horned animal sacred to the god's sister, Artrumis. The bright paint and rippling folds of Apulu's garment call to mind archaic Greek kore um, in Ionian garb, but Apulu's rigorous striding motion, gest gesticulating arms, fan-like calf muscles, rippling drapery, and animated face are distinctly Etruscan. Some scholars have attributed the Apulu, state, uh, Apulu statue to Volca of Ve, the most famous Etruscan sculptor of the time. The statue's discovery in 1916 was instrumental in prompting a reevaluation a re of the originality of Etruscan art. Servitary Sarcophagus Statues in terracotta were not confined to temples and other public structures in Etruria. One of the masterworks of archaic Etruscan sculpture, a terracotta sarcophagus, comes from a tomb, as do many other important Etruscan artworks. Found at Serv uh, Servi Servitary, the, uh, <laughs> the sarcophagus takes the form of a husband and wife reclining on a ban banqueting couch. It consists of four separately cast and fired sections, once brightly painted. Although the man and woman on the couch are life-size, the sarcophagus contained only the ashes of the husband or wife, or perhaps both. Cremation was the most common means of disposing of the dead in archaic Italy. This kind of funerary monument has no parallel at this date in Greece, where there were no tombs big enough to house large sarcophagi. The Greeks buried their dead in simple graves marked by a stele or a statue. Moreover, although banquets were common subjects on Greek faces, which by the, um, by the late 6th century BCE, the Etruscans imported in great quantities and regularly deposited in their tombs. See Greek paste painting, page 110. Only men dined at Greek uh, symposia. The image of a husband and wife sharing the same banqueting couch is uniquely Etruscan. The man and woman on the serv servitary sarcophagus are as animated as the Apollo of Ve, even though they are at rest. The woman may have held a perfume flask and a pomegranate in her hands, the man an egg, a symbol of regeneration, compare figure 6-9. They are the antithesis of the stiff and formal figures encountered in Egyptian funerary sculpture, also typically Etruscan and in sharp contrast to Greek statues of similar date with their emphasis on proportion and balance, is the manner in which the servitary sculptor rendered the upper and lower, and lower parts of each body. The artist shaped the legs only some Sum, summarily, 
summary, summarily. <laughs> I can write, but I can't speak. <laughs> and the transition to the torso at the waist is unnatural. The sculpture's interest focus on the upper half of the figures, especially on the vibrant faces and gesticulating arms. The servitary banqueters in the Ve Apulu speak to the viewer in a way that archaic Greek statues, with their closed contours and calm demeanor, never do. Bandi um, Banditasia Necropolis The exact fine spot of the servitary sarcophagus is unrecorded, but it came from the ban um, Banditasia Necropolis, where, beginning in the 7th century BCE, Wealthy Etruscan families constructed enormous tombs in the form of a mound or tumulus, a practice, uh, a practice documented much earlier in Mycenaean Greece. Two of the most elaborate servitary tombs are the Tomb of the Shields and Chairs and the Tomb of the Reliefs, both of which accommodated several... Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> several generations of a single family. The Etruscans created the elaborate interiors of both tombs by ga uh, gauging the burial chambers out of the bedrock, or gouging the burial chambers out of the bedrock. In the Tomb of the Reliefs, they covered the sculpted walls and piers with painted stucco reliefs, hence the tomb's modern name. The stools, mirrors, drinking cups, pitchers, and knives effectively suggest a domestic context underscoring the connection between Etruscan houses of the dead and those of the living. Other reliefs, for example, the helmet and shields over the main funerary couch, the pillows are also shallow reliefs, are signs of the elite status of this servitary family. The three-headed dog beneath the same couch is Cerberus, guardian of the gate to the underworld, a reference to the passage from this life to the next. Tarquinia. Large underground burial chambers, hewn out of natural rock, were also the norm in Mon mm. Monterose mm, Monterosi <laughs> Monterosi, sure. In the Monterosi necropolis at Tarquinia, earthen mounds may once have covered the Tar Tarquinian tombs too, but the Tumulti no longer exist. In contrast to Servitary, the subterranean rooms at Tarquinia lack carvings imitating the appearance of Etruscan houses. In approximately 200 tombs, however, paintings decorate the walls, as in the Tomb of the Augurs. Painted tombs are nonetheless statistically rare, the privilege of only the wealthiest Tarquinian families. Archaeologists have succeeded, have succeeded in locating such a large number of them because they use periscopes to explore tomb interiors from the surface before considering time-consuming and costly excavation. Consequently, art historians have an almost unbroken record of mural painting in Etruria from archaic to Hellenistic times. Tomb of the Leopards Two important tombs, the Tomb of the Leopards and the Tomb of the Triclinium, are about 40 years later than the Tomb of the Augurs. The Leopard's Tomb takes its name from the beasts that guard the burial chamber from their perch within the pediment of the rear, of the rear wall. The confronting felines are reminiscent of the panthers on each side of Medusa in the pediment of the Temple of Artemis at Corfu. But mythological figures, whether Greek or Etruscan, are uncommon in Tarquinian murals, and none appear in the augurs, leopards, or triclinium uh, yeah, uh, tombs. In the Tomb of the Leopards, banqueting couples, the men with dark skin, the women with light skin, in conformity with the age-old convention, are the subject. They are painted versions of the terracotta sarcophagus from Cervatieri. Pitcher and cupbearers serve the, de the guests, and musicians entertain them. The banquet takes place in the open air, or perhaps in a tent set up for the occasion. In characteristic Etruscan fashion, the banqueters, servants, and entertainers all make exaggerated gestures with unnaturally enlarged hands. The man on the couch at the far right, on the rear wall, holds up an egg, 
a reference to rebirth in the afterlife. The tone is joyful rather than somber. The banqueters do not contemplate death. They celebrate the good life of the privileged Etruscan elite. In stylistic terms, the Etruscan figures are comparable to those on 6th century BCE Greek vases before late archaic painters became preoccupied with the problem of foreshortening. Etruscan painters uh, were somewhat backward in this respect, but in other ways they outpaced their counterparts in Greece, especially in their interest in representing the natural world. In the Tomb of the Leopards, the quote, landscape, is but a few trees and shrubs placed between the entertainers and leopards and behind the banqueting couches. But in at least one Tarquinian tomb, the natural environment was the painter's chief interest. Tomb of Hunting and Fishing. In the Tomb of Hunting and Fishing, scenes of Etruscans uh, enjoying the pleasures of natural de- uh, what? Oh. <laughs> Enjoying the pleasures of nature decorate all the walls of the main chamber. In the detail reproduced here, a youth dives off a rocky prom promontory uh, while other others fish from a boat. Brightly painted birds fry, fly freely overhead. On another wall, youthful hunters aim their slingshots at the birds. Um. The scenes of hunting and fishing recall the paintings in Egyptian tombs and may indicate knowledge of that Eastern funerary tradition. The multicolored rocks evoke those of the Akrotiri spring fresco, but art historians know of nothing similar in contemporaneous Greek art, save the tomb of the diver at Paestum. That exceptional Greek work, however, is from a Greek tomb in Italy about a half century later than the Tarquinian tomb. In fact, the Paestum painter probably based the diving motif on older Etruscan designs, undermining the outdated art historical judgment that Etruscan art was merely derivative, cannot speak today, and that Etruscan artists never set the standard for Greek artists. through here to see if I can get more done. <laughs> Later Etruscan art. The 5th century BCE was a golden age in Greece, but not in, in Etruria. In 509 BCE, the Romans expelled the last of their Etruscan kings, Tarquinius Superbus, <laughs> really? <laughs> and replaced the monarchy with a republic form, re republican form of government. In 474 BCE, the allied Greek forces of Cumae and Syracuse won a victory over the Etruscan fleet off Cumae, effectively ending the Etruscan dominance of the seas, and with it, Etruscan prosperity. Classical art. These events had important consequences in the world of art and architecture. The number of grandois Etruscan to tombs, for example, decreased sharply, and the quality of the furnishings declined markedly. No longer did the Etruscan elite feel, fill their tombs with gold jewelry and imported Greek vases, or decorate the walls with paintings of the first rank. But art did not cease in Etruria. Indeed, in the areas in which Etruscan artists excelled, especially at the casting of statues in bronze and terracotta, they continued to produce imp impressive works, even though fewer in number. That number may be even smaller than traditionally thought because one of the masterpieces of this era, the Capitoline Wolf, definitely pronouncing that first word wrong, has recently been attributed to a medieval Italian workshop. Chimera of Arezzo an unquestioned masterpiece of Etruscan bronze casting is the late classical Chimera of Arezzo. Found at Arezzo in 1553, it inscribed Tinseville? <laughs> Etruscan for a gift to the god, Tinia, indicating that the Chimera was a votive offering in a sanctuary. The Chimera is a monster of Greek invention 
with a lion's head and body and a serpent's tail, restored in this case. A second head, that of a goat, grows out of the lion's left side. The goat's neck bears the wound that the Greek hero uh, Bellerophon inflicted when he hunted and slew the mythical beast. As rendered by the Etruscan sculptor, the chimera, although injured and bleeding, refuses to surrender. The monster's muscles are stretched tightly over its rib cage as it prepares to attack, and a ferocious cry emanates from its open jaws. Some scholars have postulated that the statue was part of a group originally including a Bellerophon, but the chimera could easily have stood alone. The menacing gaze upward toward an unseen adver adversary need not have been answered. Hellenistic art and the rise of Rome. At about the, at about the time that an Etruscan sculptor cast the chimera of Arezzo, Rome began the appropriate Etruscan territory. Vea fell to the Romans in 396 BCE after a terrible 10 year siege. The Tarquinian, Tarquinians forced uh, forged a peace treaty with the Romans in 351 BCE, but by the beginning of the next century, Rome had annexed Tarquinia too, and in 273 BCE, the Romans conquered Servitary. Ficoroni Sista. Sure. <laughs> An inscription on the Ficoroni Sista reflects Rome's growing power in central Italy. In the 4th century BCE, Etruscan artists began to produce a large number of cistae, cylindrical containers from a root, from what? for a woman's toiletry articles made of sheet bronze with cast handles and feet and elaborately engraved mm -hmm, bodies. Along with the engra engraved bronze mirrors, uh, they were popular gifts for both the living and the dead. The Ficaroni Sista, found at Palestrina, takes its name from an Italian collector, Francisco de, uh, de Ficorini. The inscription on the Sista's handle states that Dinda Melconia, a local noblewoman, gave the Sista, the largest found to date, to her daughter and that the artist was Novios Plautios or Plautios, not sure. According to the inscription, his workshop was not in Palestrina, but in Rome, which by this date was becoming an important cultural as well as political center. The engraved frieze of the Ficaroni Sista depicts an episode from the Greek story of the expedition of the Argonauts, the crew of the ship Argo. In search of the Golden Fleece, Art historians generally agree that the composition is an adaptation of a lost Greek panel painting, perhaps one on display in Rome, like the presumed model for the Alexander mosaic. Another testimony to the growing wealth and prestige of the city that was once ruled by, by Etruscan kings. The Greek source for Novios Plachios, uh, Plachios's um, engraving is evident in the figure seen entirely from behind or in three-quarter view, and in the placement of the protagonists on several levels in the um, Pelignoten manner. Porta Marzia. In the third century BCE, the Etruscans of Perugia formed an alliance with Rome and were spared the destruction that Vei, Servitary, and other Etruscan cities suffered. Portions of Porcia's ancient walls still stand, as do some of its gates. One of these, known as the Porta Marzia, Gate of Mars, was, was dismantled during the Renaissance, but the upper part of the gate is preserved, embedded in a later wall. A series of trapezoidal stone, um, who, voussoirs, if that was on one line I could pronounce it, I swear held in place by being pressed against each other, form the ar ooh, arcuated gateway. The central voussoir is a keystone, 
Arches of similar construction have been documented earlier in Greece as well as in Mesopotamia, but Italy, first under the Etruscans and later under the Romans, is where the arch hmm. arcuated gates and freestanding, quote, triumphal arches became a major architectural type. The use of pilasters, <laughs> pilasters? To frame the rounded opening of the Porsche Marcia typifies the Etruscan adaptation of Greek motifs. Arches bracketed by engaged columns, or pilasters, have a long and distinguished history in Roman and later times. In the Porta Marzia, sculpted half figures of Jupiter and his sons, uh, his sons Castor and Pollux, and their steeds look out from between the fluted pilasters. The divine twins had appeared miraculously on a battlefield in 484 BCE to turn the tide in favor of the Romans. The presence of these three deities above the arched passageway of the Porta Marzia may reflect the new Roman practice of erecting triumphal arches <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with gilded bronze statues on top. Lars Peluna Pu Pulena, <laughs> Lars Pulena. In Hellenistic Etruria, the descendants of the magnificent archaic uh, terracotta sarcophagus from Servitary were coffins of local stone. The leading production center was uh, Terquinia, and that is where, during the late third or earlier or early second century BCE, an Etruscan sculptor carved the sarcophagus containing the remains of Lars. Pulena. The scene sculpted on the front of the coffin shows the deceased in the underworld between two charons, Etruscan death demons, swinging hammers, two vants, winged female demons, stand to the left and right. The representation signifies that Lars Pulena has successfully made the journey to the afterlife. Above, the, the deceased reclines on a couch as do the, the couple on the Cerevetary sarcophagus and their counterparts in the Tomb of the Leopards and the Tomb of the um, Triclinium. But this Etruscan gentleman is not at a festive banquet and his wife is not present. The somber expression on his middle-aged face contrasts sharply with the smiling, confident faces of the archaic, archaic era when Etruria enjoyed its greatest prosperity. Similar heads, realistic but generic types, not true portraits, can be found on most later Etruscan sarcophagi and in tomb paintings. They are uh, symptomatic of the economic and political decline of the once mighty Etruscan city-states. Nonetheless, Lars Pulina was a proud man. He wears a fillet on his head and a wreath around his neck, and he displays a partially unfurled scroll inscribed with his name and those of his ancestors, as well as a record of his life's accomplishments. Aule Metele. One of the latest extant works produced for an Etruscan patron is the bronze statue portraying the magistrate Aule Metele, raising his arm to address an assembly, hence his modern nickname, Aringator, or orator. This life-size this life-size statue, which dates to the early first century BCE, proves that Etruscan artists continued to be experts at bronze casting long after the heyday of Etruscan prosperity. The time coincides with the Roman achievement of total domination of Etruria. The so-called social war ended in 89 BCE with a conferring Roman citizenship on all of Italy's inhabit inhabitants. In fact, Aule Metele, identifiable because the sculptor inscribed the magistrate's Etruscan name and those of his father and mother on the hem of his garment, wears the short toga and the high laced, boot, laced boots of a Roman magistrate. His head, with its close cropped hair and signs of age in the face, resembles portraits produced in Rome at the same time. This orator is Etruscan in name only. If the origin of the Etruscans remains the subject of debate, the question of their demise has, a has already answered. 
Aule Metele and his con compatriots became Roman citizens, and Etruscan art became Roman art. And there's the big picture. That was a pretty short chapter, if you ask me. Um, kind of surprised uh, that I didn't have to take more breaks. I will have to take more breaks in chapter 7. I haven't looked how long chapter 8 is yet. Um, I hope uh, your class is going well, and I hope this helps. I'll see you next time, maybe. <laughs>